So good afternoon, homeschoolers. How are you today? Fantastic. Oh, great. What? I didn't even like. I know dead people that are louder than that. How are you today? Good. Nice. All right. So this is class number two of apologetics. Now. Let's see how smart you guys are, because I know you're homeschooled and you're high schoolers. So if this is class number two, what did we have last week? Class number one. That's, see, you guys are great. I, it's like, let me tell you, you're the envy of, of your peers, let me tell you. All right, let's do a little bit of a recap of last week. Now, we learned apologetics. What does the word apologetics mean? Yes, sir. It means the intellectual defense of the faith and truth of the Christian religion. Very good. It means to, to, to make a defense. And we saw that biblically. There were a number of New Testament texts that we looked at last week that said, you know, uh, so and so, you know, Paul made a defense at, on, on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. Um, Peter tells us to always be ready to make a defense. So apologetics does not mean to apologize. I, want, I was talking to somebody once and I said, oh, I'm learning about apologetics so I can talk about my Christian faith. And they're like, don't apologize for your faith. Like, we should be, you know, we should be confident of our faith. And yes, that's that's not what apologetics means. It just means to make a defense. And we make a defense of all kinds of things. You know, we make a defense about why it was wrong that Tom Brady lost the game this last weekend. Yeah. I mean, I can make a defense for some bad calls from the refs and some bad drops and all that stuff. Not that... Can we just talk about that for like an hour and a half? I think, I think we should. I think we should. Because I, I think thought, we should. Like, was that amazing, that comeback? And then it was squash. Yeah. Like, ah. Man. I was actually this really is a fallen world, let me tell you. All right. But uh, apologetics. Now, Norman Geisler is a really uh, super smarty apologetics guy. He's written a ton of books. And he came up with a really good uh, illustration for, or, or definition of apologetics. Anybody remember what that was? Approximately, what did Dr. Geisler say the, the point of apologetics is for? Yes, sir. It was something along the lines of opening the door and clearing the rubble so that they can see God. Yeah, yes, so clearing the rubble so they can see. Now, what is it that they can see? God. Yes, and specifically? Uh, so people can come to know Jesus Christ. So people can come to know Jesus Christ. That's where I, guys, here's what I want you to know. Apologetics is all about getting people to know Jesus Christ. If, if we just, if there's all kinds, look, we could, and, people, and there's all kinds of hurdles that are in the way. People say, I can't believe that you believe in faith because, uh, you know, I'm an atheist. And don't you know, uh, you know, atheism is the way to go. And we can answer that. We could use our apologetics, which we will learn, to give an answer to that. Or they might say, oh, you Christians, you know, all you want to do is tell women what to do with their body. And, you know, you, you, you hate abortion and all that stuff. And we'd be like, well, no, we, we don't want to tell women what to do with their body. But the baby is not the woman's body. It has its own DNA, its own everything. Oftentimes, has a different blood type, even. Um, and so, you know, and, and we can give we can give an answer. Uh, people say, "Well, Jesus never even existed anyway. You don't even know that he even existed. That he, you know, he's a, he's a mythological. You know, he's he's up there with Zeus and Apollo and all that stuff. And, and and we can give an answer about that. And when we're doing that, we're moving the the rubble. We're moving the rocks out of the way so that they can see Christ. But if we don't give the gospel, then we, 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 we've lost it. I mean, there's, there's no point in doing apologetics just to get people to, what? So we want people to become, you know, pro-life and become uh, theists? Look, the devil's a theist. The devil believes in God. He even believes in Jesus. But he doesn't, he has not received Christ. He, has, he doesn't worship him. He doesn't submit to him. He has not received the gospel, the good news that we can be reconciled to God through faith in Christ. And so if we're just arguing with people, even if we're just winning, it does no good unless we present Christ. Now, is it our job that, that they get saved? I, is it, like, are we only successful if people are like, yes, I want to know Jesus, and please baptize me now? No. 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 I mean, we'd love to see that. But, you know, it's our job to plant seeds. God waters the seeds. He makes it grow. He gets the glory. So yes, we'd love to see salvations, but it's it's good to be a part of it. I teach an evangelism course, and I, I say that evangelism <laughs> is like, whoa, what was that? <laughs> Yikes. And, uh, Boy, that can get rid of a whole bunch of rocks, That whatever that was. That's the wind that came out of your face. Dude, go see a doctor. Evangelism is, is like is like football. 
you know, it's, it's I, I love football. My, my, my kids always say, Daddy, you're always looking for reasons to talk about football. <laughs> yeah, I kind of am. But this is a good one. Like, everybody wants to be the, the person that catches the, you know, the ball thrown by Tom Brady to win the Super Bowl. But it took a lot to get them there. There was the play where a running back grabbed it and went up a few yards. And then there was another play where, you know, it was a little screen pass. And there was another one where maybe they went back a few yards. And, or maybe they got a penalty and it didn't go so well. Or maybe they had to take a timeout. Or, but, but it took a bunch of So who's responsible for that touchdown? Is it just the quarterback and the wide receiver who catches it? No, it's, it's the whole team. It's the coaches. It's the people who wash the jerseys. It's the people who, who sell the tickets. It's everybody. And as Christians, we're on God's team. And yeah, of course we want to be the person that, you know, spiritually goes into the end zone and spikes it. But be part of the team because it's, it's, it's a, uh, it, it really is a team effort. God uses all of us. You would never have thought that I would have got saved. I was such a horrible, God-hating person when I was in college. And I grabbed a hold of me, but it took a bunch of people. It took a bunch. It, you know, I can look back and see, oh yeah, look at all those conversations I had over the years. So in, in learning apologetics, you're going to learn how to outsmart a lot of people. And it's going to be really easy because today it's like the people, are, it's like they're getting dumber and dumber. Like, it, it, seriously, it's, it's like logic and being able to just have a rational conversation and make a point and then make another point and then make another point and have those points go together to make like a conclusion is, a, is like a dying art out there. So you could use what you're going to learn to make people feel stupid, but that's not the point of it. One of my favorite apologists, a man named uh, Dr. Greg Bonson, uh, he passed away, but he's just terrific. Uh, he, he said something once, and I've always remembered it. He said, Jesus didn't come down to win arguments. He came to win men. Men and women. Men meaning human. Um, I'm not very woke. So uh, the point is, if, if we just argue and win arguments, which you could do, that's not what we came to do. We came to win people. And so we, we, were, we removed uh, the obstacles that get in the way so people can see Christ. And we let the Holy Spirit do his work of saving people and turning people's heart towards him. And that's what it is. But hopefully in the next 14 and a half weeks, you will get wicked smart and you will fill your head with all kinds of knowledge. And God will use that knowledge to help to use you to help other people to remove those, those boulders so that they could see Christ and turn to Christ. And that's what we want to do. So, all right, I have a video I want to show you. It's just a few minutes long. Now, I didn't name this video. I didn't come up with the name of it, okay? You can search for it on YouTube. You'll find the name. It's called, I think it's called something like Cute Atheist Girl, Girl Debates, Debates Christian. Christian, right? I, I kind of weird. I didn't name it that. Yeah. Now she's cute. She's cute. My wife is cuter, and my daughters are all cuter. But no, she's cute. I can see why whoever posted that put it there. Uh, Tamsi has a really cute voice. <laughs> so uh, watch this video. She says she's very typical of what you'll see in atheist, and, and what she says is very typical. I want you to pull out, and I'm going to ask you, what were some of her arguments against Christianity? Now she's not going to say here's argument number one. It doesn't work that way. But you'll be able to by listening to her, you'll be able to pick it up. Yeah. I just wanted to be sure I didn't know. Um, the book is helpful because you can write notes and stuff, but who needs a book? That's the best back. We got books. We got books. Good job, Isaac. Nice. Everybody give him a round of applause. And I want you to watch in this video how the Christian man responds. Not just what he says, but how he says it. And we'll talk about it. We'll be back in just a minute. and I also write for the Guardian newspaper. I'm David Larlam, the Assistant General Secretary of the Trinitarian Bible Society. Well, 
I started this campaign in response to the evangelical Christian ads, which were running on buses last year in June, which had a Bible quote and then a website which told anybody who visited it that all non-Christians would burn in hell for all eternity. Now, do you agree with that? Do you believe that all non-Christians will burn in hell for all eternity, bearing in mind this is 68% of the world's population? Yeah, probably more than that. But um, You think they will? That's what the Bible says. So you think that all Hindus and Jews and all other faiths are, are going to hell? Absolutely, because Jesus Christ said, wow. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Yeah, that was but the great the message yeah. is that people do not need to go to hell. I would also say I support your advertisements because I think it's good that people have freedom of speech in this country. Many countries don't have that. We should cherish that. I completely agree um, with you. And I believe that anything that prompts people to think about God, which your advertisements have done, is a good thing. That's I would great. prefer there to be the word of God on the side of buses, and maybe one day there will be. But I am pleased that your advertisements have not been banned, because not only are they provocative and, and, and constructive, you might say, but I also think that they are misconceived, if I may suggest that, you can in, suggest in the favour <laughs> of, of sensible consideration of God. Because you say, now stop worrying and get on and enjoy life. Is that... Correct, now more stop less. worrying and enjoy your life. Right now, so is that implying then that if you believe in God, um, you no. don't enjoy life? No, not at all. It's talking to non-believers and saying that if you don't believe in God, there's nothing to be worried about because you're not going to hell. There's no scientific evidence of hell, and we very firmly believe that to be true. Yeah. So, do you believe that just by writing those words on the side of a bus, people would genuinely stop worrying? Because I would suggest to you that they won't. If people are worried about the existence of God. That's a good thing, because it's making them think about the most important subject there is. I don't think it's good. And I would to be rather they saw anything. something like this if I might show you one of our posters. This is Jesus Christ's own invitation, a command: "Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest." Now I've done that, and He did that for me. You don't have to believe this. You, you don't. It's a very, very negative idea to believe that we are all born as bad people and that we can only redeem ourselves by believing a certain thing or telepathically communicating a certain thing. It's a, it's a form of kind of mental control. Yeah. Now, there is absolutely no reason why you should believe there is a giraffe over there. There isn't one. <laughs> Just as I feel for myself, there's no reason for me to believe in a god when I see no scientific evidence of yeah. one very passionate about representing atheists with these adverts because we've never had a voice before, we've never been heard and now we are expressing our viewpoints and hopefully that will bring comfort to a lot of people who never knew that there were so many people who felt the way that they did. So how can somebody get comfort from the fact there is no God? That's a bit of a, a contradiction. I believe it's very comforting to know that this is one life we have, we should live it to the full and that when we die nothing will happen, we'll just be at peace and at rest and we believe that it's very yeah. important for people to take full advantage of the opportunity we've been given. All right. So what do you think um, the Christian man did well in that? Yes, ma'am. He quoted scripture. Yeah, he quoted scripture. That's always a good idea. Because look, I have an opinion, you have an opinion, everybody has an opinion. Uh, you know, I've heard that if, if, if you want five opinions, you ask three people. Um, <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, this thing has an opinion, apparently. Uh, and you know what? Ultimately, our opinions don't really matter. It's what God says. Now, I know an atheist doesn't believe that, but whether they believe it or not, it's still true. It's ultimately what God says that's important. So, yeah, quoting scripture is always a good idea. Um, because what, what does quoting scripture do? I want to stay on this for just a little bit. Like what, what, what advantage does that do? If I'm talking with somebody who's not a believer and I quote scripture, yeah? It sort of keeps you grounded and knowing that you are speaking the truth. Keeps you grounded, knowing that we're seeking the truth. What else? It can make our hearts by reading scripture. 
Yes, God uses scripture. The Holy Spirit will use scripture. When I was an unbeliever and I was fighting with my friend Josh and I was telling him what a moron he was for, for not, you know, for, for believing in this fairy tale, you know, he, he planted seeds and, 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 and it, was, it was me going into the word of God, even trying to disprove it. I was trying to disprove it, but that's why I was reading it. But the word of God got into my head. And, and the Holy Spirit used that to, to save me. So even to, and sometimes I've had people say like you know I, I'll say things like you know well Jesus said that I'm the, I'm the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father but by me John fourteen six the gentleman said the same verse and I've had I've had atheists say to me yeah but I don't believe that and what I responded I don't get derailed there I just say I know you don't I know you don't that's why we're having this conversation you know if you believed that then you'd be a believer and you and I would be talking to other people but I get it. You know, so but, but whether people believe it or not, it's still true. And there's power in the word of God. So definitely use that. Yeah, you your head up for a while. Go ahead. He didn't get angry. Sometimes as Christians, when someone doesn't like listen or believe what we want them to believe, we get angry. And he stayed very calm. He did not get angry. That's correct. He did stay very calm. And that is, that's great. Definitely do that. Like, don't get angry. Whenever I have an evangelism team out or I bring people out, I always remind them of uh, Romans 12, 21, which is do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And Proverbs 15, 1, which is a soft answer turns away wrath. It's amazing what you can say if you just say it nicely. And it will really, it will diffuse what could be a very tense situation. Yes, sir. He like listened well. He didn't really interrupt even when she was trying to, and he was like patient and respectful. He was patient and respectful, yeah, and he did listen well. I actually thought they were both pretty patient and respectful. I thought it was a nice civil conversation from both sides. So just to, to go through a few of these, and you guys picked out a bunch of them already. Uh, he was kind. Like imagine that. You know, we can talk to people who disagree with us, and it's okay. You're allowed to be kind. Um, he complimented her. Uh, he said nice things about her. He even, you know, talked about how uh, uh, her campaign, her atheist campaign, to put up those those signs, getting people to think about God. You know, and I mean, can can atheists do things that are good? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Can unbelievers think right things? Yes, of course they can. And we can compliment them on that. It's okay to do that. Uh, finding common ground. And then I think they, they found some common ground on freedom of speech. You know, they talked about that. You know, that's good. I mean, I don't know what the whole conversation was. I mean, we just got a snippet. My guess is they probably found compliments and common ground on other things, too. Like, oh, like, you, look, you look nice today. And maybe, he, you know, and, and maybe she said something nice to him. I don't know. Or maybe they found common ground where they both like the same coffee. Or, oh, wait, that's in England. No, they don't like coffee. They like tea. Like tea. I know, I know. But it's okay. We can find common ground. It's all right. Um, he was unashamed. That's really important because nothing gets me angrier. Okay, that's a hyperbole. That's not true. Other things do make me angrier than what I'm about to say. But what I'm about to say makes me pretty angry. When I see somebody, a Christian on TV or on YouTube or something, and someone's you know really trying to get him and say, "Are you saying that Jesus is the only way to heaven?" and they they kind of backpedal and get scared and go, "Well, he's the only way that I know." Have you seen that? I hate that. Yeah. No. No, we can be confident. He's not the only way we know. He's the only way. You know, if it were my opinion, then yeah, he'd be the only way that I know. But God told me that. So since God told me that, and I can trust my Heavenly Father, I know he's the only way. And, and this man was. Like, she's, she said, like, are you telling me that like 68% of the world is probably going to hell because they're not Christian? And... He said, actually, it's probably a higher percentage than that. That's what he said. I don't know if you remember, but you can watch it again. Just look up on YouTube, cute atheist girl. He, she said, like, he said, yeah, probably a higher percentage than that. And yes, because that's what Jesus said. He was confident and, and unashamed. We don't have to be ashamed of what we believe in. We do not. We believe that we were made on purpose by a God who cares about us and cares about what happens in the universe. We're not a bunch of cosmic accidents. There's a reason why everything happens. We believe that. We believe that every person has dignity, whether born or, or, or not yet born or old. Even if somebody is in, in a vegetative state and they have no purpose for society, well, we believe those people have a purpose anyway. 
They have a purpose because they're made in God's image. That's not something we need to be ashamed of. We believe in uh, equality for everybody. We believe in the love of God. That God is about rescuing people. That God is about seeking and saving. That's a good thing. We don't need to be ashamed of that. And he used the Bible. We talked about that. And that is so key. Because the truth, the word of God, is, is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So as much as you can, definitely use the scriptures. Because even an unbeliever, even if they scoff at it, man, you just don't know how the Holy Spirit's going to use the word of God in, in the life of, of an unbeliever. Or even an unbeliever. It would be good for your faith, too. Um, so what were some of the, uh, the arguments that the atheist girl used? Yes, ma'am. No scientific evidence. There's no scientific evidence for it. Are you looking at a head in my PowerPoint? That's the first one. You're going to hear that all the time. There's no scientific evidence for God. I think what she said was there's no scientific evidence for hell, which yeah. I found a little bit funny. Um, Why do you find that funny? Because um, it's like hell isn't something you can prove scientifically. Like okay, stop, stop, stop. Zip it. Zip it. Zip it. Zip it. Zip it. You, you, you. Good job. Very good. <laughs> you to get them too. I've been not giving them away. Sorry. I get, you know, or something. distracted. <laughs> what? Uh, I you getting when you were asking about apologetics. I did too. Did. Uh, whatever. <laughs> you're, you're, you're done. Oh, wait. That was so uh, Kit Kat. That was a Kit Kat, wasn't it? Oh, man. <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. Swatted. It's gone. I just ruined your life. You won't have a Kit Kat. All right. So uh, there's no scientific evidence for God. I get this all the time. And here is something that uh, a very good apologist named Greg Kokel. Have you ever heard of Greg Kokel? He came up with tactics. That's another class you guys should take. My very good. Yeah, it's good stuff. So he says this, this strange <laughs> saying that when someone says, there's no scientific evidence for God, he just asks them, just kind of, hmm. And he says, well, can you weigh a chicken with a tape measure? Now, you don't have to say that if you don't want to. But I want you to understand why he says that. Can you weigh a chicken with a tape measure? You guys are homeschoolers. Some of you have chickens. I know you do. I did. Yeah, yeah, all right. Well, uh, I, sorry, we got 25 of them in my backyard. Yeah. So, technically, if you got the average weight of a certain size of chicken and then measured the size of the chicken and then guess and then also use your, like, Knowledge of how heavy things are, you could kind of do that. Wait, yeah. what, what's your name? Candy. What, what, what is, is it? Hannah, you, Hannah, you get you negative candy, candy, and you're on my <laughs> you're on, you're on my Am not I so wrong? nice list. You're on my naughty Am list. No, no, that's yeah, actually yeah, a good you point. And you just ruined great vocal. All right, fine. Not, it's just yeah. tape it's, right. it's saying can, the tape measure can't give you the weight of the chip. That's, that's right. Tape measures measure. Like distance, length, and weight is measured by a scale. That's right. Do I get so, candy? <laughs> no. No, in fact, you're never getting candy for the next 14 weeks. No. Yeah. All right. And I think what people, when they say, oh, there's no scientific evidence for God, they're trying to make this do it, like this, this false... Uh, a fight between science and religion. Like, you got religion on one side and science on the other. Science and religion are not at odds with one another. I want you to know that. Science and religion are not at odds with one another. Good science actually proves religion. I was, I was watching uh, an interview with, with an atheist yesterday, and he was saying, well, he's more of an agnostic, because he was saying that, he's like, the more I studied science, the more I believe in God. But now he doesn't believe in the Christian God, and he, hasn't, and he even said, I don't know who God is, I have no idea. But he's like, you know, as we get into quantum mechanics and all these things, and we learn about the intricacies of the universe, he's like, it's impossible that we're even here. It just, it couldn't come about by chance. And I thought, isn't that fascinating? You know, one person, the more they learn about science, the more they believe. And another person, the more they learn about science, the less they believe. And you know what? I said I wasn't going to use the whiteboard, but maybe I will. Do we have a whiteboard marker? A marker? That's a permanent marker. That's not going to work. <laughs> uh, do we have a whiteboard marker? It could work permanent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these markers will work, but they'll only work one time. Um, There's something on the hockey table. I don't know what kind of a marker it is, though. 
I don't see it. Oh, air hockey, not baseball. Oh. Hmm. This is what happens when I go off script. Dry erase. Nice. Who did that? Who fucked up? That was me. <laughs> you can give it to me it instead. It was Hannah. It's okay. All right, I'll give you candy, but I don't feel good about it. <laughs> sure. That's good. See, typical mom. That's good things, but sometimes bad timing. Um, sure. Mario, sorry. Don't tell my wife I said that. All right, this is better, because I think you'll be able to see this from a, more of a distance. Okay, who thinks it says God is nowhere? Okay, who thinks it says God is now here? You're both. Can both be true at the same time? No. And that's the funny thing about science and evidence is that see, uh, scientists and, and Christians we look at the same evidence, but we come to different conclusions. One person can look at, at Jesus Christ on the cross and find out that we've all sinned. And that there's no salvation, that the biggest thing that we need more than anything else is for someone to take our sin upon themselves. And they hear that message, and one person says, God is now here! Yes, Jesus is God, I get it, I get it! My biggest need is taken care of! And yet another person can hear the exact same message and say, eh, God is nowhere. Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? So it's not, we're not at odds with science. We have the exact same evidence that they do. It's just that. We see it differently. And uh, why did I get into all this? Can you weigh a chicken with a tape measure? Means, I think when someone says, oh, you know, you, you can't prove God with science, but I think they're trying to create this, this fight, this tension between science and Christianity, and there is nothing. Okay? Um, as I said before, some people, the more they study science, the more they believe in God. And some people, the more they study science, the less they believe in God. So it's not, it's not about that. Um, so let's get to what is what's really being said here, which is, I think what she's trying to say is that the scientific method can't can't give evidence for God. And remember the scientific evidence? You know, you observe, you come up with a hypothesis, you test it, you see if your hypothesis was right. Maybe your hypothesis was wrong, maybe it's right, and then you get a whole bunch of other scientists who do the exact same thing under the same conditions, and if they all get the same answer, then you can say, oh, okay, we learned something about this. We learned about the properties of, of metal. We learned about when it's heated a certain way, or, or when you know, candy is digested into the, the stomach of a teenager, they get wacky after 20 minutes, or, you know, or you know, we, we, can, we can test things, we can repeat it, we can learn about it, we can touch it. The scientific method can only prove things that are physical. Now let me ask you a second grade Sunday school question. Is God physical? No. No! no. Right. You get an for that. No. Science can only observe <laughs> physical things. Thank you. There, there you go. Um, God is spirit. So that doesn't mean that God can't take on a human body from time to time. He can do that. Of course he can. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. But God is not, you can't prove God through the scientific method. And what that's called is a, a, a category error. That's what, uh, if you're into logic, you'll call that a category. You're using the wrong tool to measure something. Yeah, the scientific method isn't the right tool to say whether or not God exists or doesn't exist. Uh, it's like saying, can you weigh a chicken with a tape measure? And you can, it's the wrong, it's the wrong tool. And that's fine. And by the way, you're welcome to say to someone who says this that you know there's actually a lot of things the scientific method can't prove. The scientific method can't prove that Alexander the Great ever existed. He can't observe it. He can't test it. He can't do it over and over again in different labs and make sure you get the same response. It's not the type of thing. No, you don't do it that way. Now, does that mean that we can't ever find out if Alexander the Great existed? No. Yeah, we can find that out. But we, we, we do it through different tools. Just like we can find out how much a chicken weighs. You can put up the chicken on a scale. Well, you can find the average weight of a chicken and then figure out how big the thing is. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah, fine. I'm right. I'm, I'm 
Right, okay, fine. Go home, tell your mom you were right and that I the will. teacher doesn't like you. <laughs> I like you just fine. I like you just fine. Here, I'll oh. give you a... Here, can you share? You got candy, don't worry. Yeah, I'll give you a Twix. Do you like Twix? Yeah. Whoa. Good. Ooh, two candies. Don't yeah. choke on it. All right. <laughs> the scientific method can't tell you what, you know, whether or not Benjamin Franklin discovered electricity. Can you observe it? Can you test it? Can, no, it doesn't, you can't tell that. Now, can we know whether or not Benjamin Franklin invented electricity? Yeah, we can know that, but we use different tools. The scientific method can't tell you whether, you know, whether or not MTV ever played music. I know, there was a day when it did. Crazy. But again, you can't prove that with the scientific method. And there are lots of things the scientific method can't prove. However, um, it's like saying that you can weigh a chicken with a tape measure. Oh, and as I said before, that's called a category error when you know, you're using the wrong tool to try to prove something or give evidence for something. And then they're using it against you. You know? So it's it's so if someone comes up to me and says, you know, there's no scientific evidence, you can't use science to prove God, I'd say, well it depends what you mean by science. If by science you mean, you know, can I touch it? Can I can I observe it? Can I test it? Can I do it over and over and over again? Well, yeah, you're right. I can't prove the existence of God that way. I also can't prove whether or not George Washington crossed the Delaware River that way, because I can't just see it over and over and over again. But that doesn't mean that there aren't evidences for God. So I'm quick to tell an atheist or someone who's attacking me that, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be very confident. There are plenty of evidences for God. Yes, Mr. Sam? Not all chickens have the same density. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> So like not able to teach this class and I have no idea where I am. Where are we? Like the color of the chicken could change the weight. No. <laughs> is it a South African swallow? Is it a right? I don't know. <laughs> you guys are killing me. Now, because God is good and kind, God can be proven or evidence can be given for him. It's just not through the scientific method. So I'd be quick to tell somebody, you're right, I can't, I can't prove to you that God exists by getting a tape measure, or getting a scale, or getting any kind of measuring that measures physical things, but I can give you plenty of very good evidence for God. We can do it through uh, philosophy. You know, things like, hey, you can't have a watch without a watchmaker. Last week we talked about, can you have a sandcastle without a sandcastle maker? -er. You know, that's, you know, I could give you the teleological ar argument or the ontological argument, or one of my favorite arguments is uh, the transcendental argument. But, so yeah, we can, we can give evidence for God. We can use history. Just like, okay, you know, how do we know that George Washington crossed the Delaware? Well, we weren't there, and nobody that we know was there, and nobody that we know before that was there. Nobody was there. But the way you do it is by looking at historical documents. And are they, and you look at them, are they reliable? And there are ways of doing that. There are actually scientific ways of looking at that. Or maybe we find a monument. Somebody built a statue, and it says, here is where George Washington crossed the, De the Delaware. And you know, you get enough people giving evidence of that, and you say, yeah, I think it happened. And in the same way, uh, with the Bible, you can do that. With, with archaeology, you know, the, the Bible talks about uh, civilizations in different places. And, and, and there, were, there were plenty of historians that said, see, the Bible's not true because those places don't exist. It's talking about places that don't exist. And then you know you dig a little bit more and they dig and they find it. And they go, oh, wow, what do you know? That that civilization the Bible talked about is there. That when you open a Bible and it talks about these, these places, they're very specific. And, and the more you dig and look through archaeology, the more we find that it, this this great evidence. What? Yes. A few months ago, archaeologists found a site of explosion that approximately lines up with Gomorrah. Wow. Good stuff. You see, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. And that does not happen with other religions. Um, in, in the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon, it talks about events that allegedly happened in the Americas in the 18th. 4th, 5th century. Yes, it was written in the 18th century, but it was the events allegedly happened in the 4th century. And it talks about big battles with arrows and all these huge battles, you know, in, in New York State. And when they go to these places in New York State to see, they can't even find an arrowhead, not even one. Like, it's, it, archaeology does not confirm what, what it says. But the Bible's not like that. The Bible, archaeology does confirm 
Um, and there are many other uh, evidences or types of study that can give evidence for the Bible and the truth of Christianity. Even subjective experience. I mean, that's not a great evidence all by itself, but used along with others. I, I see what Jesus did to my life. He changed me. If you had known what I was like before, or maybe I had a miracle happen. And I have. I have had miracles happen where people, you just cannot explain it. How it happened. It's nuts. I'll give you a quick one. Last year, uh, actually right around this time, uh, we had a very old car that kept breaking and it cost a lot of money and every time it broke it cost me more money and you know I'm a missionary so I don't have a lot of money and uh, it just it was just really annoying and it got to the point where our car was had so many miles on it and it just kept falling apart it was just ridiculous and I remember my wife said alright Mark this is the day that you're going to go and buy a Honda Odyssey because it'll be perfect for your ministry you'll be able to put all your stuff in there and it's still big enough to hold big people because you bring people you know to the subway to the universities all the places that you go and I found one it's a used one it's like fifteen thousand dollars you're going to have to we're going to have to get a car loan and we're like we don't have the money for a car loan and we're like is it, you, you need it it's, you're just going to have to do it and this is what you're going to do this is a true story by the way and so I did what a lot of guys do when we get stressed out. We just go and think about something else. So I went and, and, and snowblowed my, my driveway because it snowed because it's this time of year and it's winter, so it snows. You following? Yeah. I kid you not, while I was taking care of the snow on my driveway, uh, a gentleman that I know sent a text to me that I didn't get right away because I was, I was out snowblowing. You got that, right? I was out snowblowing the driveway. <laughs> so then when I came back, it said, hey, Mark, give me a call, and so I gave him a call. I don't really know this guy all that well. Like, I, I know him, but not very well at all. Uh, and uh, certainly, I don't talk to him all that much. And uh, he said, hey, how are things going with you? And I'm like, oh, they're fine. And he's like, well, specifically, like, how's your car? And I'm like, ah, oh, well, it's funny you should say that. I mean, you know, God's going to take care of us, but I think even today I'm going to go get a minivan because we, we need to replace our car. Like, it's... It, so it's funny you bring that up. And he's like, well, that's really interesting because God told me to buy you a brand new Honda Odyssey today. And he did. He picked me up and he drove me to the Honda place in Manchester and he wrote out a $35,000 check and bought me a brand new with like eight miles on it. The same day that I was going to break down and go get one, the same vehicle that I was going to get. Like, how do you make that up? And it's not like I know him really well. It's not like I'm always complaining to him about my thinking car. He's just like, no, I think this is good. And he did. And I get, by the side of the church, you'll see it. What was it's, that? It's a, it, was, it was just about a year ago. So there's a 2021 Honda Odyssey right on the side of the church right now that I drove here. And, uh, man, what a piece of junk. It's already one year old. <laughs> I need to get a new one. I should call him up and say, all right, time to re-up. <laughs> Pretty sure God said that uh, <laughs> some yearly thing. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I heard Ferrari. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. Nice. So, um, look, is that evidence for God? I would, I would argue yes. I wouldn't say that that alone should make you into a Christian. But let me tell you, I know a lot of unbelievers have heard that story and were like, they can't, they can't explain it. Um, people do have miracles. There's, there's a great documentary you can look up online. It's called Send Proof. Send Proof. Proof. Anybody ever heard of that documentary? It's brand new. It's really cool. I watched it, and it's about uh, a gentleman who he wants to document miracles that there's proof for. So not like, oh, I my leg got healed, but like I had a big problem, and we have X-rays, and then we prayed, and now I don't have that problem, and now we have X-rays. And you can watch the documentary. It's really interesting. It's called Send Proof, and it's really neat. God worked in. Uh, this young man's life, he was born uh, where his, uh, he had this horrible stomach ailment where uh, his, his stomach didn't, couldn't do peristalsis where, you know, it, it moves the food like into the intestines and I guess it's the intestines that do that. I'm not a doctor. And he was like that for like 16 years and it was awful. I mean, the way they, to keep him alive, they do it. He had two tubes, one to food go in, one for food coming out. And they prayed and at a prayer meeting, the tube started shaking and started moving. And it shouldn't do that because he was paralyzed there. And he got perfectly fine. And, and he lived for years after that. They had him on video. He's like, he's in his 20s. So the miracle happened like 10 years previously. 
And the doctor was like, we have no idea. This has never happened, ever, ever, ever. It's never happened. You know, things like that. So is there evidence for God? Yeah, there is evidence for God. And we, we can be confident about that. We don't have to be shy about it. <clears throat> are there fake miracles that people just claim are miracles and they're not really? Yeah, there are. Are there charlatans that just try to? Yeah, there are. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't really work. And, um, and again, we can be confident that there's plenty of evidence for our faith. Evidence through philosophy, history, archaeology, subjective experience, just even, you know, uh, manuscript evidence that the Bible can be trusted. So don't ever let anyone try to get you to believe that there's no evidence for God, because there's plenty of evidence. And that's how you weigh a chicken on a scale. And it's very cute. And you can go, aww, aren't they sweet? I thought those were chicken nuggets. <laughs> no, those are future chicken nuggets. That's what those are. Potential. All right, what was a, another argument that the atheist girl used? Yes, ma'am. How can Jesus be the only one? Is that in my notes? Yes. No. Yes. It I is. really should look at the notes more yes. often. You just stood there on the screen I, for like five seconds. Yeah, I did. I, I know. All right, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you'll hear this a lot. And, and the, the atheist girl, I wish I knew her name. She said it really quick, but she said it with a British accent, so I can't understand anything she said. Um, how can, how, you mean to tell me that Jesus is the only way to God? Yes, Sam. The greatest person solved the greatest problem with the greatest solution. Okay, everybody put your book away. <laughs> <laughs> but we're taking notes. Yeah, I literally I'm taking notes all the time. Hey. Hey. Wow. Hey. When, when, you know, she said, it, she pretty much started it right away. She said, like, you mean to tell me that, you know, people who are Hindus and Jews and other religions are going to hell? And, you know, it, it sounds like an issue of fairness. Like, that's not fair. You know, and it's, it's almost like it's petty. And, and it sounds almost like, so what you Christians are saying is like, you know, you're at a high school and there's a bunch of cliques. And if you join the right clique, then you're good. But if you join, if you don't join that clique or that club or whatever, then, then I guess, it, you know, God sends you to hell. And, and doesn't that sound unfair? But that's not the way it works. That's not what it's about. It's not like you don't go to hell because, anyway, we'll get into that. But it's, it's an issue of fairness. And it's not really an issue of fairness. It's an issue, so who knows, what is it, what is the reason why people go to hell? Who knows why? <clears throat> who said that? <sighs> <laughs> Hannah, again. But that was a great answer. <laughs> Anybody remember what sin stands for? Stinky, inner, nasty. Na I knew you knew, because I've been to your church like a hundred times. Yeah. But not recently. Maybe we should talk to the pastors about that. You're memorable. I'd like to come back. Sorry. Right. Stinky internet. That's why, that's why we go to hell, is because of, of sin. Look, if, if uh, let's take two people. We're going to take Sam and, oh, let me think, uh, Hannah. And you're both in an airplane 30,000 feet above the earth. And I tell you both that you're about to crash. And as your pilot, I'm going to explain to you that's bad. Right? <laughs> and I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna offer you both a parachute and tell you that the parachute can save will save you. And Sam thinks about it, and he goes, huh, okay, 30,000 feet. And he puts a parachute on and he jumps and the parachute comes and he lands and he's fine. <laughs> Hannah says, huh, okay, I get it. Okay, nah, I don't really need the parachute, I'm fine. And she jumps out and falls 30,000 feet and screams the whole way and splatters on the ground. March early. Yes. No, 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 not that bad. I'm not that evil. Okay, what was the cause of Hannah's death? And by the way, can we all say how sad it would be if Hannah passed away? Like, wouldn't it be, it'd be really sad. Okay, so. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It'd be ter no, it would be terrible. Shame on you. So, why did Hannah die? What was the cause of her? If you had to write it on a death certificate. Girl, yes, sir. Stinky inner nastiness. <laughs> yes, I mean, ultimately everybody dies because of sin, but yeah, Katie. Gravitational force? No, it's the sudden stop at the end. Very close, that's right. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, smarter man. I mean, you're both kind of right. Um, I'm actually surprised no one gave a different answer. Yes, sir. Suicide. Suicide? <laughs> well, maybe not. Maybe not. I mean, yeah, but not necessarily. Yes, sir. Disbelief. Disbelief. Okay. A lot of people say, and none of you have said, it's fine, 
a lot of people say, well, she didn't put on a parachute. That's why she died. No, that's and that's not why she died. She died because she broke the law of gravity. She hit the ground at a high velocity, and that is going to put pressure on her whole body, and she's going to explode. Okay? Yes? No, it's because of the unfairness that only parachute users live. That's right. Right. It would be ridiculous to say, hey, that's not fair, you know, because, no, it's, it's not because of lack of fairness that she died. It's because she broke the law of gravity. If anybody breaks the law of gravity under those same circumstances or similar ones, you're going to die. Anybody. Now, if you're offered a parachute, the parachute could save you, but you didn't die because of failure to put on the parachute. Do you understand that? You didn't die because of failure to put on the parachute. You died because you hit the ground at a high velocity. Yes? Are you saying everybody is, all, is um, falling from 30,000 feet for their whole life and they're off the parachute the whole way down? Yes. yes. That's what I'm saying. Where's my Well way? said. Well said. But I'm not going to give you candy because I think you brought it up just to get candy. No, I got it because it and thought it made me sound smart. I know, it's smart. Honestly, <laughs> it's All right, so... Here's the thing, because a lot of people say, are you saying that people are going to go to hell because they didn't believe in Jesus? Yes. And no, we're not saying that. No, people are going to go to hell because they've broken God's law. Because everybody has lied when they know it's wrong to lie. Everybody has stolen when they know it's wrong to steal. Everybody has hated people when they know it's wrong to hate people. Look, you want to sum up what God expects of you? If you want to sum it up, love your neighbor as yourself. And no one's done that. None of us. Nobody. Not even Hannah. Um, we haven't done that. We've all broken that law, and that's why we're going to die. That's why we go to hell. Now, God is good, and He, because of His great love, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus is willing to save you, but if you don't put on the parachute, so to speak, then you can't blame Jesus for that. Well, what about people that are never offered a parachute? Well, God's God. He's not obligated to offer a parachute to everyone. If that person doesn't sin, they'll be fine. But they're going to sin. Everybody. And by the way, God is really good. He's given people dreams and visions. People get saved in Muslim world where they're not allowed to hear about Jesus. It's amazing. God sends missionaries out. You know, when people say, what about people who haven't heard? I go, well, I'm really glad you care about those people. So what you need to do is become a Christian and become a missionary and go to those places where the people haven't heard. But... You've heard, so you're not that person, are you? So, is Jesus the only way? Yeah. Is that unfair? No. It's not unfair. Because you don't go to hell for lack of believing in Jesus. You go to hell for breaking God's law. And I love that, because that allows us then to, you know, when you clear that rubble, to get right into the evangelism and say, have you broken God's law? You know, listen to your conscience. You know, you have and I have too. It's, it's okay to say you have, too. Say, yeah, I've, I've broken God's law, and so have you. We all have. Yes, sir. Can I elaborate on, my, on the analogy? Yeah, go ahead. Um, actually, Jesus is falling with you with a parachute, and he gives you his. Oh, nice. Dang. Not, whoa. So Jesus Jesus doesn't just offer you a parachute, he no, gives you his. I don't Jesus, Jesus, is, is, Jesus is your parachute. No, right, Jesus. He gives you his because he dies. All right, well, like any analogy, it's not perfect, so... Um, <laughs> so it's your fault. Okay. <laughs> so it's your fault. Why is that even doing that? All right. Um, so, you know, when they say, oh, is Jesus the only way? The other thing, too, is we can really put it on Jesus and say, well, Jesus said he's the only way. And because, again, the authority comes from him. Jesus is the greatest person who ever lived. And he talked about who he is and his relationship with the Father more than any other subject. You know that? That is what Jesus talked about more than anything else. Some people say, well, Jesus talked about hell the most. No, he didn't talk about that. Well, people talk about, I've heard, I've had people say people, that Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven the most. Well, he talked a lot about that, but that's not the most, you know. I've even had people say he talked about money the most. No, he didn't talk about money the most. He talked about himself. Because he... Now, if I talk about myself all the time, I'm conceited and rude and a narcissist. And if any of you talk about you all the time, you are too. But Jesus, being God, is in a unique position that when he talks about himself, he's not being a narcissist because he's actually talking about the greatest thing there is. 
there's nothing greater than him to talk about. So it's so he's unique. He's in a specific position. And the reason why he talks about himself is because he has authority. And authority is, is a really good word to think about. Now, you might not use that word with an unbeliever, but, but have that word in your mind. Who's authority? Who gets to decide? Who's in charge? If Jesus is who he said he is, if Jesus is the creator of the universe, then the question is Saul. What question? All of them. Is there a God? Is the Bible true? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Is it real? Can we know? Is this just all made up to make people feel better? Or is, it, is, is there real evidence? See, if Jesus is who says he is, if he died on a cross and rose from the dead three days later, then that solves it. And it's not about my opinion. It's not your opinion. If nobody in the world believed it, it would still be true. And if everybody in the world believed it, it would still be true. It just it is true. And so that, and I love that. If Jesus is who he said he is, is, is a great place to go because then you can talk about that. And now instead of talking about whether or not hell is fair and all that, and Jesus being the only way is fair, you know, you remove that rubble, and now you're talking about the gospel. Who do you think Jesus is? That's a great question. Who do you think Jesus is? Man. Jesus solved the greatest problem. Our human heart, we've got a disease way worse uh, than uh, cancer. We have a disease called sin. And a little bit, we talked earlier about the, the Christian man in the video and how he was kind and nice. It's really, really, really important. Okay? It's amazing what you can say to somebody if you do it nicely. Are we have the time. Okay, do it around. Um, it's amazing what you can get away with saying. So I have a, an open air message that I give quite a bit, like, out in public. And I use my paintboard. And I basically make the case that cancer is really bad. Okay, um, what's your name? Amanda. Amanda. Nice to meet you, Amanda. So I'm gonna say, Amanda, if you, if I were your doctor and you had cancer, and I hope that you don't have cancer, that would be terrible. But if you did, would you want me to tell you? Yeah. But Amanda says, for those who can't see, she's like, yeah. You want to know? Why would you want me to tell you that awful news? That would ruin your day. If you had plans tonight, you would, you wouldn't even be able to go. You would, you'd be crying and it'd be awful. Why, why would you want me to tell you such awful news? You want to know, and also you'd want to know what else if you found out you had cancer. What, what is something else you'd want to know? Yes, sir. The treatment. Yeah, the treatment. Is there a cure? And so, um, yes, we do want to know bad news. There are times when we do want to know bad news because if I, if I, okay, let's say I was your, I was your doctor and you had cancer and you didn't know your cancer, and I said, you know what, I, I don't want to ruin your day, so I'm just not going to tell you, and I'm going to say, you know what, you're fine, you're perfectly healthy. Am I being a good doctor? No, because. A man, poor man, is going to walk around and she's going to keel over and die. And maybe she should have, she could have got treated. And the thing that I tell in my message uh, on my paintboard is, I say, you know, with cancer, after about five years, the six, the the the, the live rate, the, the success rate, if you're still living, is about sixty percent. So of everybody who gets diagnosed with cancer today in the United States, according to the American Cancer Society, in five years, sixty percent of them will still be alive. That's pretty good, I guess. I mean, it's better than. You have a better shot than not, but it's it's not great. Um, but there's a worse disease than cancer. And cancer can only kill you, that's all it can do. There's another disease called sin, and we all have it, everybody. And it has a 100% death rate. Everybody who gets sin dies and goes to the lake of fire. And you might be mad at me for telling you that, but if I didn't tell you that, I'd be like a cancer doctor that didn't tell you bad news because I didn't want to upset you. And you should be asking, is there a cure? And there is a cure. The cure is that God himself, because of his great love for us, came down and took, took our sin on himself. Christ suffered for sins, the righteous, that's him, for the unrighteous, that's us, to bring us to God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, anybody, will not perish but have everlasting life. And I use those Bible verses because it's powerful to use God's word, even if people don't believe it. My point is this. I, but basically what I'm telling people in the, when I give this message is that nobody's good, that everybody's a sinner, that God hates sin, that we 
justifiably are heading to hell. And I, because I do it nicely and I explain why, I explain what sin is and I explain who God is, I have people come up to me and say, well, you know, you're, you're a nice preacher. I pre they shake my hand. They say, thank you so much for explaining that. Like, that's really nice. He's like, you, I've heard people say, like, you're not one of those mean preachers that I've heard. And I'm like, and, and, and to myself, I always think, but I am one of those mean preachers because I just told you mean things. But I said it nicely. So, um, I mean, I've heard it said that a, a, a woman from the South can tell you to go jump off a bridge and use all kinds of F words with it as long as she ends it with, bless your heart. <laughs> and she can totally get away with it. And there's something to be said for that. Something to be said for a soft answer turning the way around. Yes, ma'am? I just had this kind of weird thought, but I was like, I wonder if you could prove the scientific method sin. <laughs> Actually, I'm gonna say, I feel like it's so evident, but... Well, you know. my next thing, it's funny you say that, sin is the only Christian doc doctrine that can be scientifically verified. Right. <laughs> because sin, actually, we can verify that. You can, you can get a bunch of scientists with their, their, their pen and paper and watch somebody throughout their whole life and write down all the things that they do. <laughs> they could be watching me from, from the day I grace this world to the day that I die, and you will see a whole bunch of sin. You will see me being rude. You will see me being selfish. You will see me tantrum. You will see me doing all kinds of mean stuff. I even make fun of teenagers. <gasps> I know! And the Jets. Great. And the Jets and fans. Cleveland oh. Browns. Yeah. Oh, nice. The yeah. Seahawks fans. Shut up, Nick. Please make fun of him. No. Right now I'm mad at the Rams. So. Those are just the things we can see, can I say? And, uh huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Very good. Those are just the things. <laughs> Those are just the things we can see, that's right. And if, if, if this, but that's enough, just seeing the outside. So sin is, is, you can observe it, you can see it, you can see it over and over again. Yeah, we're, we're pretty bad. And so our greatest problem isn't that we need something to make us feel comfortable. The, the, the cute atheist said, oh, I think it makes me feel comfortable, atheism. It makes me feel good. And then the other, the Christian said, well, I think Christianity makes me feel good. Come unto me, all you heavy laden. But you know what? The, the problem isn't whether or not you feel good. The problem is that you, we have a sin problem. We're going to stand before a righteous God. Yes, sir? I think that's kind of funny how she said that, because a lot of people are like, religion is just something someone made up to feel good. And she's like, yeah, I'm atheist because it makes me feel comfortable. Right. I know that's very uh, uh, smart. All right. Just said, boy, I'm going to do a whole bunch of candy. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, so sin, sin is our biggest problem that we have. Our biggest problem isn't that we don't know what college we're going to go to, or who we're going to marry, or that you know I have straight hair and I want curly hair, or I have curly hair and I want straight hair. That's not our biggest problem. Our biggest problem is we're going to stand before a holy, righteous God. That's our biggest problem. And who can solve it? Only Jesus can. The greatest solution. Every religion says you must do something. You do it. You work. You earn your way to God. And maybe, just maybe, God will, will accept you. Maybe. And Christianity says, no, Jesus says it's done. It's over. I love this. And Christianity, Christianity is the only true story where the villain dies for the hero. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I said that wrong. See, that's what happens when I try to look at you and not look at the notes. See, I was trying to be good. I was trying to, you know, let you, you know, think that I actually care about you, little miscreants. And so I was trying to look at you. And in doing so, I wasn't looking at okay. I won't do that anymore. In Christianity is the only true story where the hero dies for the villain. Much different. Um, but it's true. And that's what Jesus did. He died for us. In every society, the king sends out his people to die for the king, die for the, the country. And in Christianity, Jesus, our king, went out and died for his people and defeats our greatest enemy, which is death. So uh, it's not fair um, that Jesus is the only way, but, but it is. He is the only way. Now you know how to answer that. Well, you can't. You can't prove God scientifically. You go, well, if you mean by the scientific method, then I, I grant you that. But God gave us plenty of evidence. He gave us archaeological evidence. He gave us philosophical evidence. He gave us manuscript evidence. He gave us all kinds of evidence. And then you present that. And you will learn how to do that over the next 14 weeks. Well, Jesus, are you saying Jesus is the only way? Well, I, I, I didn't say that. Yes, he is the only way. And I believe it. And I know it's true. But it's because he said that. Because we have a big problem. And it's sin. We've all broken God's law. And he's the only solution to that. He died for sin. 
He died on a cross. He rose from the dead. Lots of people died on crosses. Only one rose from the dead, and that's him. Oh, by the way, there's evidence for that, too. We'll get into that in a future class. So the third thing that she said, uh, I mean, she said many things, but the third argument that I took out is, you know, she kind of made fun of hell. Like, really? You really believe they're going to burn? Like, doesn't that sound kind of silly? Sounds kind of like a fantasy, like a cartoon. Hell isn't reasonable. And you'll get that a lot. People will say that. They're like, you would never burn your child. So why would God burn his children? Okay, so what's the problem with that argument? Yes, sir? They're not his children. If they're his children, they'll go to heaven. They, that's exactly, ah, nice. Exactly. Is that one of the biggest lies people believe is that we're all God's children, and we're not. God only had one child. His name is Jesus. Everybody else has to be adopted into his family. Now, here's the good news. You can be adopted into God's family, and then you won't be sent out. But people, people, part of the problem is people have the wrong view of what hell is. Now, the last class that I showed this to had no idea what the far side was. I love that was weird. Okay. So can I just say that you guys, no, don't tell the other class this in, in, in Auburn, New Hampshire, but I like you guys way more because you know what the far side, I can't, they, they did not know what the far side was. First of all, I can't be that old. And secondly, yeah, I know the far side came out like when I was a kid, but it's so good. The far side is the best depiction of hell, I think. Yeah. yeah. Not very accurate though. Yeah. Did you also tell them that you like that more? I'm not saying anything. I ain't got nothing to say about that. So most people have an unbiblical view of the lake of fire. You know, and so here, you know, they get, get it from the far side. I mean, here's, here's, you know, Satan. He's wearing a red cape, and he's got a whip, and he's, you know, he's whipping people into flames, and he's got other demons there. And they have pitchforks and horns, and, and like, even the coffee's cold. Like, you know, so that it says, oh, man, the coffee's cold. They thought of everything. You know, it's just a place where it's just, it's so awful. It's so bad. Although I like iced coffee. Ice coffee's good. Room so this is not a perfect coffee, analogy. Though? What's that? Room temperature coffee, though? No, no, not room temperature coffee. No, no, no. Spew that out of your mouth. And this is not what hell is like. This is what's called a straw man. So a straw man is, like, say Amanda is, let's say Amanda says she loves uh, chairs. That's why she's sitting in a chair. She makes that argument. That's her argument. Amanda says she loves chairs. And I say, Amanda is ridiculous. Don't even believe anything she says. Because Amanda said that everybody in the world has a comfy chair. And everybody in the world does not have a comfy chair. I mean, that's ridiculous. Her argument falls apart because I can show you, I can introduce you to people who don't have comfy chairs. Now, what was wrong with my argument? <laughs> yes, the two smarty, the twin brainiacs here. Yes. You don't have a chair. Well, no, that would be making her point. Oh, no. Oh, no, that's making my point. But that's not what's wrong with what I did. What was wrong with what I did? Yeah. You weren't attacking her argument. You were pretending that you said something else and attacking that. Here it is. I was not attacking Amanda's argument. I was, I, I misrepresented her argument and attacked that. And that's called a straw man argument. A fallacy. It's a straw man fallacy. And uh, it's, it's because people who are into logic and stuff, they have to come up with cutesy names for everything. <laughs> and so instead of attacking Amanda's position, I created like a scarecrow out of straw of her. And it kind of looks like her a little bit. And I'm attacking that. And people do that all the time. When they say, well, you really believe in hell? Like, you know, because they're thinking it's, it's, it's like comical. Like something from the, this is not what hell is like. So they're not actually attacking the biblical lake of fire, they're attacking this. It's only comical because people made it that way. Right, right. But they're not attacking the real thing. Yeah. Um, and it isn't technically it's just being separated from God as well. Like, it means, yes, there's Correct. fire, but I mean, Correct. it's more significant. Correct. And I tried to throw you some candy, but I probably hit the lights again, That's so we wouldn't have to do that. <laughs> so, it's all right. Um, you could probably make the jets, though. <laughs> yeah, I probably could make the jets. Yeah, I think I could. So, uh, Exactly. The biggest straw man I see with hell is when people say things to, like, to me about, they say, well, you know what, I'd rather go to hell because it sounds like a lot of fun. I'll listen to Ozzy Osbourne music and play pool with my friends. You know? <laughs> and now why is that a straw man without the person even realizing they're doing a straw man argument? Because that's what they believe is hell? Yeah, that's not what hell is. You're not hanging out with your friends listening to Ozzy Osbourne. Ozzy Osbourne may or may not be there, but, and I hope he's not there. I always hope that people get saved, anybody. But 
No, that's not what hell is like. If you want to do a study on what the lake of fire is, we can do that. We don't have time for that today, but, but it's not this. I can tell you that. Um, and it's serious. Um, people say, well, hell isn't, isn't reasonable because nobody can do a crime so bad that it's worth an eternal punishment. But they're seeing things the wrong way, and I'm going to give you the have you stepped on an ant argument. You ready for the have you stepped on an ant argument? And I added this. Aaron, who wrote this book and did the original slides, didn't. So it's not in your book. So don't look there. Hmm. Do you get in trouble for killing an ant? Say, do you get in trouble for killing an ant? No. No! I you can kill all the ants you want. They even sell ant killer at Walmart. You can mass genocide a whole colony of them, and no one's going to give you any crap at all. My brother was. He told my mom that I almost got in trouble because my brother was so upset about it. Wait, your brother really killed your mom? What? Wait, In fact, you might get congratulated for killing ants because they get into your house and they pee on your cabinets and it's not good. Oh, I mean, it's, not like, it's not a lot of pee, you don't see it, but it's there, okay? Now all of you go home and make lunch and think, is there ant pee? Like, good, I hope you have that in your head. There probably is ant pee. <laughs> Um, somebody might say, what's wrong with you if you step on an ant? But that's about it. Now, next question. Same uh, thing, killing. Same at. That's the word. I couldn't think of the word at. All right. Same at. Do you get in trouble for killing a dog? In America? Yeah. Yeah, in America, yeah. Not in um, yes, you get in trouble for killing a dog. Yes, yeah, Liberty. In New Hampshire, if the dog is... Chasing your livestock, you can kill it and not get in trouble. Okay, but that's okay. We'll get into that in a second. No, no, well, no. Hold on to that. That actually has some significance to my third thing. Um, typically, yes, you will get in trouble for killing a dog. There, there are animal cruelty statutes, and also if the dog belongs to somebody, you know, you, you're destroying someone's property. Um, you're kind of a psycho because typically people that just hurt animals for no reason, not for your reason, but uh, not saying that you did that. Although maybe you did. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> you, no, don't kill animals. It's bad. But you're not going to jail for it. All right, next question. Same at. Do you get in trouble for killing a homeless person? Yes. Yes, yes you do. Because now you're killing a human being. But! You don't know that person. They don't know you. Maybe they don't have a good reputation. You get a good lawyer. You might be able to make the case that they were they were chasing after you, and you felt uh, like you were in danger of your life. See, who you was going to come up, and then maybe you could get it, or maybe you could say it's an accident, or you know, you could probably work it out to maybe getting manslaughter, <laughs> which means it's like, yeah, I killed somebody, but it's uh, it's kind of okay. You know, it's it's kind of like watered down. But it's like, but it's fine. Just right, and yeah, it's like, yeah, I killed somebody, but it's fine. I'm not a lawyer either. Um, I know I'm Jewish, but that doesn't mean I'm a lawyer. Not all Jews are lawyers. <laughs> I know, just most of them. All right, most of us. So, yeah, you, you do get in trouble for killing a homeless person. All right, do you get, same act, do you get in trouble for killing your wife? Yes. Typically, yeah. Typically, yes. <laughs> That's actually my wedding picture right there. I, 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 Hold on. I, I, yeah, I, I'll show you my wedding picture. You've been giving away too much candy at classes. Yeah, I think I have been. Um, you know, it's really hard to argue manslaughter when you kill your spouse because you know that person. It's you know you, you planned it. It was premeditated. You 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 set out to do it and you did it. And we call that first degree murder. Now, I was always concerned that my wife would murder me because I'm kind of hard to live with, and I asked her that. Because she's Scottish, too, so she's willing to, to murder somebody at any time. I mean, she could really lose it at, at any time. And, and my wife, Shelby, that's her name, by the way. Um, just You can say that to the police should I disappear. <laughs> but Shelby said to me, and I haven't forgotten this, she goes, no, I would not murder you uh, because I need your help in raising the children. There you go. I know. Some insurance. The, the problem is our youngest is like nearly 17 now, so I'm starting to get a little scared. Yeah, I know. My, my usefulness is starting to, you know, wane thin a little bit. But yeah, you get in more trouble for killing somebody you know. Um, same act. Now, and I want you to remember, because you can use this. Do you get in trouble? Let's change the act. You're not actually going to kill this person. You're just going to threaten this person, or maybe throw something at them, or spit on them, or throw a rock at them. Not killing them. So it's a lesser act, right? Do we all agree? 
that threatening or throwing a rock or is, is not as bad as actually murdering, but it's the President of the United States. What happens to you then? You probably would get tased, arrested, or shot. Right. If, you, if, if you're guilty of a conspiracy to, to, to murder the President of the United States, we're not going to see you for a long time. It's very serious. Now, is it the same act? Yes. Yes. But I want you to notice the principle here that we all can understand. Is that the higher the authority, the more serious the consequences. So when people say hell isn't reasonable, I'd say, do you get in trouble for killing an ant? No. Do you get in trouble for killing a dog? Yeah. A lot of trouble? Do you go, go to jail for the rest of your life? No. Do you get, what about if I killed a homeless person? They go, yeah, that's bad. I'm like, yeah, but maybe I don't know them and it was an accident and they jumped in front of my car or something. I could, you know, oh, all right, fine. Maybe you'll get out in five, ten years. What if I kill my wife or my kid or something like that? Oh, no, that's right. Well, what if I try to kill the president? Ooh, man, that's really bad. You know, same act, higher authority. What happens when you break the law of the eternal king of kings and lord of lords? Who's not just higher than the president by ten times, but ten times, ten times, ten by ten thousand infinity times. You know, you can break the law of Hampton Falls, New Hampshire, and get a little bit of trouble. You can break the law of the county of Rockingham or wherever we are, I don't even know what county it is. And you get a little bit more trouble, because it's a higher authority. You can break the law of, New, of the state of New Hampshire. Then you, then you go to a state penitentiary. That's the higher authority. Break a federal law, even a higher authority. What happens when you break God's law? Eternal God. See, he's, he's eternally higher authority, so yes, there's an eternal higher consequence. And that's what I want you to understand. So when people say hell is not reasonable, well, yes, it is. Because you, you don't understand how great God is. We're good for time. Um, we got 10 minutes. And I'll tell you what, I don't even have to use all 10 of them. Um, this is a good book to get, by the way, if you like this kind of thing. Without a doubt, answering the 20 toughest faith questions by Kenneth Richard Samples. What I want you to know is that our faith is reasonable that you can believe it without being a simpleton. You don't give up your brain by becoming a Christian. You don't give up science by becoming a Christian. Well, there's no scientific evidence for God. Well, what do you mean by that? If what you mean is, can I do the scientific method? No, I can't do that, but I can't do that with a lot of things. I can't do that to know whether or not George Washington was the first president of the United States. But I can use other evidences. I can use evidence, and you can give them. And you're saying, well, I'm just a teenager. I don't know those evidences. You're going to learn them over the next bunch of weeks. People say, well, you know, are you saying Jesus is the only way? I mean, that's ridiculous. Like, you know, most of the world isn't even Christian, doesn't follow Jesus. I'm like, I know, I'm really sad about that. But, yeah, Jesus is the only way because he said so. And he rose from the dead and came back, so he gets to say. When a man is dead and buried and rises from the dead on his own power, you listen to that person. They have authority. So it's not what I think or what you think, it's what Jesus thinks. And he said, no man comes to the Father but through me. I mean, you really believe in hell, that ridiculous place where, you know, it's just fire and the devil's like, you know, whipping you with a, like, well, no, I don't believe in that place. Um, hell is not a place that, you know, where there's fire and cold coffee and all of that. Um, it's a place because, because God is so holy and so wonderful that when we break his law, there are eternal horrible consequences, eternally horrible. It's a place of... Uh, Jesus called it the lake of fire. He called it a place of outer darkness. He called it a place where you're not going to be alone, you know, hanging out with your friends, playing pool. From your point of view, you'll be alone. Now, you won't be alone. There'll be tons of people there. But from your point of view, you will be alone. It's a horrible place. And God so loved you that he died to take that away. By the way, just a, a psychological tip. For years, as an evangelist, when people brought up hell, I would talk to them about hell. And I would have to spend a lot of time getting rid of that boulder. Now we have to talk about hell for a while, and I want to talk to them about the gospel, but I gotta get rid of the boulder first so we can do that. And so I have to waste time talking to them about why hell is reasonable. And sometimes you have to do that. I changed my language some number of years ago, I don't remember when. I started calling it the lake of fire. And I find that people don't argue with me about it anymore. <laughs> 
there's something about the word hell that it brings up like that the far side with the cartoons and the you know and the red suit and the you know and all that and people are like that's ridiculous there's just something about that word you know hell is just seems like a, it's, it's, it's silly our culture has made it ridiculous the lake of fire I just I just call it that which is actually a biblical term and it's actually a more proper term because hell in the Bible is not an eternal place. It's a, it's a temporary place until the final judgment. And then on the day of the final judgment, hell gets thrown into the lake of fire, which is an eternal place. Check out Revelation 20. And I don't know what it is. It's just something about, it's just psychologically, as soon as I start calling it, like, yes, I do think the lake of fire is reasonable. Or if in my preaching, I'll call it, you know, God has a, a place of, of judgment, it's called the lake of fire, no one comes up to me and says, I can't believe you believe in the lake of fire. It's never happened even once. Now it probably will. Now that I've said that, it'll probably happen next time I go out. But for the most part, use that tip if you want. Like, it's, it's, isn't that funny how human nature is? Like, th there are certain words that you use and it, it creates things. I'll give you an example. Um, I like to wear hats. Like, I, I like to wear like baseball hats. But they're not baseball hats. I, they're all nerdy Star Wars hats and Captain America and stuff like that. Batman. And uh, some of them are even Jesus hats. But they can't be cheesy. And, uh, and I like to color coordinate them with my t-shirts and stuff. I just do. All right, if you look at my Facebook and you see me out evangelizing, you'll see all the different colored hats I have. It's a thing. I like it. Whatever. So I don't wear red hats anymore when I'm out evangelizing. I have, some, I have a cool Spider-Man red hat. And I even have like a cool Jesus red hat. But I don't wear them anymore. Anybody know why? Yeah, like That's right. They look like Donald Trump hats. <laughs> now, I'm not going to give you my opinion about Donald Trump. I may or may not like him or have voted for him twice. Um, the point is, I don't want to talk about Donald Trump when I'm evangelizing. Because when I was out evangelizing, a number of times, people would come up to me and go, can't believe you like that jerky. Oh, it's Spider-Man. Sorry. Sorry. So from a distance, they see my red hat, and they think I'm wearing a Donald Trump MAGA hat. And... Right away, they just like they want to fight with me. And do I really want to fight with them about Donald Trump? No, that's a rock that I don't want there. I, it doesn't mean that I'm not willing to talk about politics. I'm glad to talk about politics. I mean, I'm glad to talk about whether or not I like or don't like Donald Trump, which I'm not going to tell you right now. I don't. I, when I'm out, when I'm sharing Christ, I don't want to talk about whether or not I agree with Joseph Biden's, you know, plan for his foreign policy. I, I don't want to tell you whether or not I approve of of President Biden. I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to tell you that he's a failure in every part of his administration, foreign, domestic, the border, the, the pandemic. I'm not going to tell you that because I don't want to give, I don't want to put that rock there, you know, inflation. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to ignore it. So you know what I do? I don't wear my red hat. It made me sad. But you know what? I, I brought my, my daughter, Judy, to the movies, and she's like my, one of my really nerdy, well, they're all nerdy. And I brought my Vivi, too. And so Judy and Vivi and I, her name's Juliana, but I, I call her Judy. And so Judy and Vivian and I, we went to see Spider-Man no, no Way Home, which is a great movie. I know. And I wore my red Spider-Man hat. So there you go. So I still have the red Spider-Man hat. And maybe one day I can wear it out when I'm evangelizing. But I just found that it causes a, a thing. I'll give you another quick story about that. Um, back a number of years ago, there was a man who was uh, up for the Supreme Court named Brett Kavanaugh. You guys remember that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of controversy because he was accused of, of, of sexual misconduct back when, you know, many years ago. The problem was there was no evidence for it. In fact, if you could get a time machine, like a Doctor Who kind of thing, back when Doctor Who used to be fun, and you went and you could see, uh, you know, you would find that in the future, uh, the, the claim of the sexual mal, mal misconduct actually fell apart. The, the accuser didn't have a, she really didn't have anything. But at the time, we didn't know. It was like, maybe he did it, maybe he didn't do it. We don't know. And, and it was a big controversy. It was being talked about all the time. It was in the news. It was like the number one headline, you know, for And so I was at the University of New Hampshire, and I was doing evangelism, and I had to go to the bathroom because, you know, I drink a whole lot of water. I don't know if you noticed that. And so I went to the bathroom, and I'm coming out of the bathroom, and a, a college student, a female college student, comes right up to me and says, you're that guy that's out there, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah, that's me. She goes, what do you think of Brett Kavanaugh? And don't you care about women being sexually assaulted? And she just read me out. So I had a choice. 
I can start talking to her about due process of law and how you need evidence, or I could, you know, talk about, well, maybe I don't like Brett Kavanaugh, I think he shouldn't be there. I mean, I could, I could get into that and have to deal with that rock, or I, what I really did was, and it was really weird because I don't, this, this is really unusual for me, but I just prayed, I was like, God, oh, what am I supposed to say here? What am I supposed to do? And I, I complimented her on her outfit. I'm like, that's a cool outfit. I really like that. That's really, where'd you get that? It's like, I don't know, somewhere online. It's like, okay. Hey, we're giving away these booklets that says, where we spend eternity. Have you ever thought about that? And she's like, I don't, know, I don't know, sometime, maybe, I don't know. I'm like, well, why don't you take it and read it? And, you know, maybe you'll, afterwards you, well, you'll see me again and we'll talk about it. And she's like, all right. And she took it. She took my gospel back and she left. I don't know if she threw it away. I don't know if she read it. But the point is, I don't want to talk about Brett Kavanaugh. Because who cares? I want to talk about eternal salvation. Because the biggest problem we are facing is not that we don't have the right Supreme Court justices. But that may be a big problem. But what's our biggest problem? Sin. 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 That's right. And so I want to talk to her about the gospel. Because it's the gospel. We want to remove that rubble and talk about the gospel. Hopefully, you guys will learn how to remove the rubble if someone says to you there's no scientific evidence, or if people say, well, hell's not reasonable, or that you know it seems stupid that Jesus is the only way. Yeah, you can get rid of that, but don't spend two hours talking about it. You want to get beyond that and get to the gospel. And if you would learn that, then you're doing awesome. You're way ahead of everybody else. Even Hannah. And Lord Jesus, thank you so much for every uh, man and woman who's here. These, uh, these, these young people are young adults, and they're smart, and they can get this stuff. And you can use them. Maybe they may become professional apologists someday, or maybe not. But if they're Christians, they will need apologetics in some sense. They will need to defend their faith, and they need to have answers. And I'm thankful, Lord, that you've given us answers, that you have. You, you gave evidences. You, you, you don't just ask us to believe blindly. Um, of course, my phone goes off now. Um, you've given us evidence, and you are very kind. I pray that you will bless every single person here and, and fill them and use them to make a difference in this world, Lord. That, um, that they will have true joy knowing that they, they're part of your kingdom. And I know that some of the people here are struggling with whether or not they're even true believers, because I read the homework, and I saw what, what some of them said. And I appreciate their, their honesty. And I just pray, God, that you would make yourself known to them so that they would have uh, really, really good conviction that they're right to believe you and follow you. Satan believes you, but he doesn't follow you. And I pray that everybody here will. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, Mark. Rock. Hey everybody, this is Mark. Hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please click like and subscribe to the channel. Please visit our website, loop-15.org. We have tons of free resources. Everything's free to help you to become a better, more effective ambassador for Jesus Christ. There's also information at loop-15.org about what my family and I do as missionaries here in New England and really everywhere through the internet. Please share these resources with other people you know through social media. And may God bless you as you take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. We love Jesus. How can we not share him with others? Have a great day.